Thanks so much, Kitu, for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from Newfoundland, Canada. You are the host of the popular YouTube channel, Kitu's Diary, where you vlog on food, cooking, and life in Canada. What people may not realize is that you spent four years of your life in a coercive Christian sect in Saudi Arabia, a sect which owes its origins to the exclusive brethren, a sect that is featured on this channel quite a bit. So uh, how are you doing today, Kita? I know from your Instagram that you live in a beautiful part of the world, but I can only imagine that, uh, I don't know, are you up to your knees in snow at the moment or, or not? Uh, not at all. <laughs> um, we did have a, a little bit of snow uh, sometime uh, last month, but then we had um, a good amount of rain and all the snow is gone, actually. <laughs> Well, before we get into your years within the cult, uh, let's just go back to your early days in India. You were brought up in India to Christian parents and attended the Church of South India. Isn't that right? Uh, so, like uh, Mark mentioned, I'm from India, uh, the south of India. So, I was uh, under this congregation called the Church of South India. It's quite popular um, in Tamil Nadu, the state that I come from. And um, this is kind of a subsect of the Church of England. So when the Britishers came to India, they established churches. And, you know, I ended up being born in one of these families that followed the Christianity uh, sect of CSI. And that's how I belong to the CSI church. It's a very liberal uh, system of uh, church in India. So uh, as far as CSI Christians are concerned, we've kind of blended our religion and culture together. So we usually wear a lot of jewelry and very flashy saris um, and clothes to church. That's something that we always love to do. And uh, we didn't have much of um, rules and regulations to follow. And we had our own lives. Like there was always a good divide between our our social life and our religious life or, or our spiritual life. We didn't have that uh, kind of interfering with each other. So it felt like a very normal life that I had all along. And I did love to go to church. I still remember my mom telling me that uh, we'll have to wear the best of our clothes because we're going to see the king. Mm. So those are the most beautiful memories I have about the CSI church in India. Now, life was moving along quite well without much drama. And then a friend told you about his church. Uh, so what happened from there? Uh, yeah, I kind of <laughs> got carried away with uh, that kind of a friendship I developed at that point with that person. And while we were talking about religion, this person mentioned to me that the Kerala Brethren Church is very similar to the CSI Church. And I was like, okay, uh, this seems like uh, it's great. And as we were uh, having a conversation, this person mentioned about how the Brethren Church is much more uh, inclined towards uh, the Bible and how it's much more uh, fascinating and all that and I kind of uh, uh, took that serious and I went to one of these churches one time and I really didn't like it but um, to be very honest uh, there were certain circumstances uh, due to which I kind of had to uh, start going to that church. I wish I could explain better but this is all I want to talk uh, about at this point and Later on, I moved to Saudi Arabia in 2014, uh, uh, and I was with my family, my relatives back in Saudi Arabia. And, um, you know, I kind of was forced into this church, and uh, I started attending church. Initially, it was it was great because um, everyone were welcoming, and they were so happy to have a new member in their church. And, yeah, I, I just went the way I was, and they accepted me for who I am, and I really thought that, this was great and those aunties there like in India we call any older uh, woman as an auntie we don't say madam like how we call in the western world so all these aunties they were very sweet to me and mm. they used to bring food to my house and um, they used to encourage me a lot and uh, it felt very nice uh, the initial days because I don't know maybe I, it felt like I'm the shiny new toy or something everyone they had their special attention on me and I kind of enjoyed uh, the attention and 
I, I kind of felt that, okay, this is going fine and this is how it's going to be. It sounded like it sounds a bit like um, what they call love bombing. Is that is that right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, that's the exact word I should use. Actually, I was love bombed to the maximum extent. Uh, it was too much to take, and I'm like, oh my god, this is like fairyland. And uh, you obviously know Saudi Arabia is a very conservative country, and there's not much to do, and you really don't get to have a social life outside your circle because of the language barrier and the mm. and the um, and the rules that come with the country. Um, so I was very happy that I found my niche and um, these uh, people that I feel like I belong to, and it kind of felt okay. So you found yourself in Saudi Arabia as a new convert to the Kerala Brethren. Uh, although you'd been treated well in the beginning, things soon started to sour, isn't that right? It felt like home and everything was going fine, just like I mentioned. And then uh, one month after I started attending regular church meetings, uh, the elders, uh, they call the, the highest authority in the church as the elder, and that can be anybody who's an older person. So the elder, mm -hmm. there were uh, two people who belonged to the elder cadre of the church. So the elders and their family, um, they had uh, two daughters who were very much younger than I am. And um, they they came to my house one day and they're like, uh, you know, we just wanted to have a chat with you. And I just thought it was a general chat because even in the CSI church, mm. the presbyter and some of the church members would come and visit you once in a while. And that's very common. So I just assume that they, they've come to just say hello or whatever. And they sat me down and they're like, uh, so it's been around a month right now and uh, we just wanted to have a talk with you. Uh, we'd really like it if you could take your ornaments off because we wanted to give you some time to settle down, but then that doesn't fit with our, uh, you know, our assembly. They don't call it the congregation, they call it the mm -hmm. assembly. So they said it doesn't fit with our assembly and people are starting to murmur and some of them mm -hmm. have been coming in complaining to us saying that why is she given um, some sort of a um, you know, extra treatment or some special treatment where all of us were asked to take our ornaments off, especially the women, uh, but then she's allowed to wear her ornaments. So what I like to mention here is that I'm really not into ornaments. I just like to wear, you know, trinkets mm. from from the tiny stores. Like the one that I'm wearing right now, I yeah. got it off the road for like maybe 40 rupees. That's not even a dollar. So I like to like keep it really simple. And uh, even that was kind of, you know, an eyesore to them actually, and they wanted me to take that off. And I was kind of stumped at that point, and I did want to tell them that it's not okay to allow me to settle down and then suddenly, you know, start acting weird with me. But then they are, like I said, they had both their daughters uh, mm. sitting in front of me, and they were younger kids, and. I didn't want to like raise my voice or act disrespectfully because that's not how I was raised. So I just maintained um, my calm. And then I didn't want to go to their meetings anymore, not because of the hearing, because I kind of felt that there's some sort of an authoritative aura that's kind of surrounding yeah. me, which I wasn't really happy about. And things started escalating from, the, uh, from that. Like I used to get forced into these meetings like I couldn't take a day off or uh, if I didn't turn up for the meetings then someone would come home and kind of see what was going on. First of all uh, I'd like to mention that uh, Kerala Brethren is uh, from the state of Kerala they speak a different language and I am from Tamil Nadu I speak a different language. Of mm -hmm. course both the languages are intelligible but you know there are some you know language barriers when it comes to understanding mm. what they're preaching or what they're trying to say and uh, they, they didn't cut me some slack actually but they were very strict with me and uh, to make up for the ornaments gone I used to kind of like wear some makeup and I used to wear some bright colored lipsticks just because I felt something missing on me and then one of these elders uh, he came to me one day and he's like why are you wearing bright colored lipsticks and I'm like I just had them in my hand and uh, then he later on told me that it's so weird for you to wear bright lipsticks. Are you trying to attract the men in the assembly mm. that you need to really put something so flashy on your face so that people can know that you're there? And I found that very offensive because 
for them the concept of a woman having her own likes and dislikes or she feeling good about herself was foreign because they didn't believe in all that they'd always keep saying women should be submissive women should be submissive i heard this like at least a million times in the four years that i spent in saudi arabia it felt like a prison for the most part and they'd kind of nitpick everything you do like there's nothing that can um, happen outside their radar so i don't know if many people know about this even my viewers like i used to work in saudi arabia and the same elder he came to uh, he came to my house one day and he's like you know women are not supposed to work as per the bible your job is to be in the kitchen and you know serve the serve the congregation or the assembly and you know later on maybe take care of children when you have a family and all that they were just talking uh, it was a very misogynistic society like i always thought misogyny mm. came with a culture i couldn't even process the fact that it was tied to spirituality or religion at this point and um, what they basically was saying is that as a woman i don't have to uh, i don't get to have any likes or dislikes and all i have to do is just listen to what the church said and the most surprising thing for me was that the women the older women as well they've been conditioned to this process that mm. they also agreed with that they didn't find anything strange about a woman having her own likes and dislikes or a woman having ambitions and dreams they found that very bizarre because of course they weren't raised in a very liberal family like me they were raised in a brethren setup yeah. so for them just being kind of a slave was okay for them but i grew up in a very liberal family and for me these rules and uh, restrictions and at some point my whole life was kind of you know surrounded by this brethren setup and their doctrines and there's nothing i could probably do even the women uh, in the in the assembly i couldn't have a good conversation with them because they knew nothing more than the bible or they would talk about cooking or that's it like uh, but i was so passionate about fashion and about clothes and about you know having a, a career and uh, doing all these really uh, creative things to set up a business and all that and these women were completely oblivious to all of this and mm. that's when i realized that i'm kind of stuck somewhere i'm kind of caught in some sort of a mess and i found myself feeling very isolated and yeah. lonely at that point that's when i really realized that you can have 100 people around you and still feel really lonely i really understood the meaning of lonely only in that church actually okay let's get into some of the beliefs and practices of this group uh what was the weekly routine like and how were you expected to behave as a member of the carola brethren mark this is going to surprise you a lot you might even get astonished but i'm uh, very happy to really get this out of my system finally after almost 6 to 7 years at this point so i don't i don't i would never call this normal but then i i'd really like to run mm. you through how a normal week would go by in a brethren setup and uh, what all happens in the church so some of the things that happened in the church is first of all they don't have birthdays uh, no christmas no easter they only believed in new year uh, because it's the starting of a new year and uh, that's okay but uh, they had their own arguments about uh, christmas being a heathen uh, celebration or easter being heathen and nowhere in the bible it talks about christmas and uh, easter or whatever and most of their uh, beliefs and doctrines were inclined to the pauline teachings as in what saint paul uh, spoke mm. about in the book of acts and uh, from then on in the bible so it all kind of surrounded the new testament like even i personally feel that paul was a i he kind of really hated women that's what i personally <laughs> believe about uh, paul as well on an average if you uh, if you really understand that saudi arabia is in the middle east so friday is the day off for us and uh, saturdays might be a day off sometimes mm -hmm. and sunday is the day we actually go to work simply because it's the middle east and friday is the holiday yeah. so the only days i get to do my grocery shopping my cooking or any of my personal stuff is monday tuesday and wednesday and um thursdays we used to have a bible study 
and out of all the books of the Bible that they could have probably talked about when I was there, uh, they kind of discussed about Revelation and uh, they talked about apocalypse and the end of the world and how it is going to be for the believers and for the non-believers and how heaven is going to look like and what hell is going to look like. I agree that I'm a Christian but then for me most of it was about being very practical. So for me I always wanted to know about what the Bible tells a Christian uh, on how to behave on a normal day. Um, hmm. I always loved the book of uh, Proverbs and Psalms because it used to talk about uh, what you need to do uh, for a particular day, like what your thoughts uh, need to be like or how the Lord is helping you or how he's going to be with you. That's the kind of uh, teaching that I was into. Hmm. And this was always like scaring you, like the world's going to end and if you're a sinner, you're going to be... It was... I don't know, I used to feel this churning sensation in my stomach and for the most part, you were co convinced that you're a sinner and you're, you're a bad person and even a child is born out of sin and these were things that I couldn't agree with uh, for the most part. See, I personally haven't gone and hurt someone or attacked someone. As an Indian, I always believed in karma more than anything else. So uh, even my mom, she used to teach me that you have to be very careful about what you speak to people and what you do and I was okay with that but this is like you know you just sit simply uh, in a chair you're a sinner and you had to do all these things and these duties and it was so scary so this is what used to happen on Thursdays mm -hmm. and um, every meeting followed a meal uh, so after Thursday meeting we'd have a, a meal uh, or dinner and this was usually prepared by the women in the church the food that was provided there is not uh, the food that I was used to but then since I'm a part of the congregation, I had to eat it even if I didn't like it. And uh, the meetings used to, uh, the Bible study used to go on up to like 9 or 10 o'clock in the night. And I was used to having my supper by 7. So I used to get super hungry and uh, this went on for four years. And then on Friday, the first thing you do as soon as you wake up is get ready to go for the prayer. So the prayer used to go on from around 9 to 1 o'clock. Sometimes they'd have uh, a few of these congregations come together and set up a prayer. So that would go on for the whole day. Mm -hmm. So anyone would think that, okay, Saturday she can rest so she has a day for herself. No, we used to hang out with the same people of the church on Saturdays and that was called our outing day and the elder would take us to a particular spot. He'd tell us the timing. We'd go and hang out. When, when we see hang out, it's more like the women will sit around and keep mm. staring at each other's face because we don't have anything common to talk about. Uh, some of the older women would sit together and start talking about the other younger women, all the gossiping and all that used to happen at that point. And the men, they used to bring in all their, you know, uh, their uh, volleyball or, you know, something to play with and they'd just go play around and we'd just sit there. And then the elder would take us to a restaurant. Uh, the food would have already been ordered. So all you have to do is go and eat. That was the first time I realized that as a woman, I wasn't even allowed to order the food that I liked. And they just assumed that this is what we're going to eat. And the food used to be kept in front of us. And then on Sundays, uh, after work, we had to go for worship. And that's the... That's the peak of my nightmare, actually, because uh, on uh, su for Sunday worship, women don't get to open their mouth, don't get to choose the song, don't get to pray, don't get to say anything at all. But by any chance, if you missed worship, then on Sundays, so if you missed worship the previous week, on Sundays, uh, irrespective of your gender, you have to stand up and give a testimony to the whole church saying that, you were you were doing this so you were here this is why you couldn't uh, be at church and uh, you have to give a testimony and then you have to also let the assembly know that you'll be participating in the lord's table and only then they'll allow you to participate in the lord's table mm -hmm. so in case you missed a few weeks and you haven't turned up the next thing you know is they'll be at your doorstep wanting to know what happened to you so this was my schedule in and out for four years and at some point I didn't find any meaning in any of this and fortunately at that point I had developed some spondylitis conditions in my shoulder so I used to take that as a blessing and I used to use that excuse to not go for the Friday um, prayer because 
we used to sit on the floor. So women used to sit on the floor and men used to sit on the chairs or couches or whatever was provided. And these meetings used to happen in different houses because, again, in Saudi Arabia, you're not supposed to worship openly. Uh, so in order to um, not get caught, they used to change the location every for every meeting. So you never uh, get to stay in one particular spot uh, continuously. So these were houses, basically, houses that had a big... Uh, living room so they used to spread mats and we used to sit down on that so the men used to sit down on the floor then after the lord's table they used to uh, sit on the chair and we women never used to even get offered to sit on the chair so i could see that that divide between genders and just because i was born a woman i was treated second class throughout these four years just because i was a woman and i come from a very very forward thinking family where uh, I was taught that as a woman it's much more important for me to have education and I should have a career and all that and this was right opposite this was like going back in time like I was stuck somewhere in the 50s or 60s of the uh, of the Indian era and I don't know I felt like I felt like a stranger for all those four years actually well there were many incidents that left you feeling confused hurt and doubtful, eventually resulting in your leaving the group. So what were some of the things that happened that led you to that breaking point? Well, personally, Mark, I did go through a lot of um, mental and spiritual abuse in that assembly, which really led me to leave. Um, so I'd like to quote some of the incidents that happened mm -hmm. for the viewers to have a proper view, uh, understanding of how it is to be in one of these cults. So there was this one time that I developed fever uh, and um, I couldn't even stand. So um, I uh, I was taken to the hospital and all the doctor told at that point was give her the first dose of her um, antibiotics and let her sleep for some time and she'd be okay. So I, I come home, take the antibiotics course and... Uh, I'm really worn out and tired. I still remember it's so fresh in my eyes. I couldn't even stand. I was uh, I was literally taken to the bed and made to lie down. That was my condition. And I was resting and I was kind of finally falling asleep after suffering for a few days. And then suddenly all I hear is a lot of voices and noises. And I know that the whole assembly is sitting in my living room. And uh, they were like, we want to pray for her. And then my family members drag me out of the bedroom and make me sit right in the middle of the living room. I couldn't even sit down. I remember leaning on the wall for support. And then they all started praying. And it's not just that they prayed and left. They were sitting there and having a chat. And I wasn't allowed to go to the bedroom and sleep for some time. Uh, this is worse than any human rights violation. Like you, you have a fever and all you want to do is sleep. And you don't get to do that. And and I used to go visit uh, my family back in India once a year. And uh, what used to happen is, again, they'll come to my house to pray and uh, mm -hmm. for my safe journey. So they'll, they'll all fl flood into the house. And, um, you know, you're leaving the country for a while. I used usually used to take maybe three or four months of gap. And then I used to come back to Saudi. So I needed that time to pack and make sure that everything is sorted out properly so that I can go home peacefully and come back to a clean house and uh, these people used to storm inside the house again and all the women would be either sitting in your bedroom or in the kitchen and you wouldn't even have privacy to actually change your clothes at that point because there's everybody uh, th there are people in literally every room of your house and these people won't just pray and leave you'll have to provide them with snacks and coffee and um, after all they're praying and all that you have to go back to your kitchen, do all the dishes because you serve oh. them coffee and snacks, and then you have to go to the go to the airport. So I'm the one who's going, uh, who's going to travel, and I'm here serving everybody. It was like a very suffocating environment because hmm. uh, the office building and the housing unit were like next to each other. You could literally see the people in the office from your window. And uh, I was asked by my family members never to open the drapes because people mm -hmm. can see me. 
and I was not allowed to go to anybody else's house to have a chat or anything. There were other women who obviously belonged to the same church living in the same housing unit, but I wasn't allowed to go to any of their houses or talk to them. And we had a WhatsApp group where women used to like post uh, recipes or Bible verses and all that. And then these men came to us and they said, you have to delete the group immediately because when women get together, all they do is gossip. So you, you women might use this WhatsApp group to gossip and this might cause some discord in the assembly. They were so scared about something that they had to keep controlling us all the time. Mm -hmm. And I also later on came to know that the, the woman who was living right below my house, she was being physically abused by her husband. I could see that she was not happy. We both tried to connect at uh, in, in a certain level, but because of the restrictions and because of all the surveillance that used to happen around us, we never once had the chance to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. But later on, I found out that she was being abused by her husband. She later on left to Mumbai and uh, with her kid. She still lives mm -hmm. there. But these men also believe that uh, domestic violence is okay. It was not just happening in this house below me. It was happening all around uh, with all the women who lived there. I kind of questioned a few people on how they could just justify domestic violence and all they said is it's the duty of the man, his responsibility to chastise the wife. I don't understand the woman already doesn't have anything that she knows of that can derail her from whatever rat race she's running. And then here the men are talking about chastising the women and this was kind of the trigger point for me and then I realized that I need to do something about this. I can't stay in this cult anymore. Yeah. And I I remember that year, it was 2016, I went to India to visit my parents. And my best friend had also fallen ill. She was in a different city in India. So she and me, we had a chance to meet together. We spent some time together. And for some reason, we started having a really good conversation with each other. And then at some point, I started sobbing and I told her the truth about how I'm stuck in a really bad place like Saudi Arabia. And I would never forget this conversation we had. And that's when she told me that it's time for you to leave. Do something and get out of there. Um, she's like, if you don't get out, I, I don't know what I'll do. I'll do something in my strength to get you out there. But first, you need to make that attempt. So she was the one who gave me the idea and said, apply to any university, do some cheap course and please get out of there. For some reason, that conversation kind of hit me hard. And then I went back to Saudi and I started exploring all these avenues through which I can actually escape. Well, after four years of life in the Kerala Brethren, you knew you had to leave the group, as you said, but there was no way of doing this without resistance. So you came up with the plan which you've just mentioned. So uh, can you elaborate a bit more on this? So like I said, I went back to Saudi Arabia. I remember one day just waking up. I just like to go back a little bit in time and let you know that um, back then I was still really a staunch believer of Christ. And that there was just this one prayer I used to say every single day before I go to sleep that, uh, God, I shouldn't wake up the next day. I I don't want to live anymore because this abuse is just too much. I can't take it anymore. And God, I've asked you to take me out of this place so I don't see anything happening. So at least make sure that I don't wake up the next day. But then at some point what happened was I woke up in the middle of my sleep after this trip that I had to India in 2017 in the month of February. And then I, the first thing I typed out on Google was cheapest universities in Canada. I would never forget that. Um, so I type out cheapest universities in Canada and there were a list of universities that came up. So I had to choose something that would actually suit my career or something that will be easier for me to study. I can't just go do any other course. So I have an engineering degree, uh, a master's in engineering, and I wanted to do something that was a continuation in that. So when I looked for courses, I found this one particular course in Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada. And it was only a year and the fees was affordable. So I just, you know, just prayed to the universe or 
the admissions gods or whatever and then I just filled out the admission form and sent it to uh, Memorial University. We call it MUN here in um, Newfoundland uh, because Memorial mm -hmm. University of Newfoundland is, is so lengthy, right? So we just say MUN. So I applied to MUN and then this happened in February and then it, you know I, I didn't really have much of hope and then I went on with my usual life and nothing changed uh, day in and day out, same abuse same frustration, same depression, uh, depression, and this is how life went on. And then around July, I get a, a reply email saying that uh, you've been accepted into uh, Memorial University, and if you can find a supervisor for your course, uh, we'd be able to provide you with an admission. Now, here is another obstacle, a conundrum that I had to like kind of uh, figure out, because. For a lot of people who've been applying to universities to find a, a, a potential supervisor is not easy because um, you know the level of education, the standards in each country differ. So to convince someone, let me be real here, India is considered a third world country and Canada is a developed country. So it's not easy convincing a Canadian professor that you're mm -hmm. going to come there and study and do uh, your fair share of amount of work to get the course running. So I, I don't have any strategies. I'm here stuck. All I'm trying to uh, do is escape from this particular setup. I still remember I sent 132 emails to 132 professors in MUN. And uh, some of them wouldn't reply. Some of them would just say that, you know, we, we're not looking for students at this point. There were just two people who replied to me. I'd never forget that person who also kind of got me out uh, here to Man because of that one reply to the email. So these two professors, they replied to me, one of them, um, her uh, area of expertise was in biology and I had an engineering degree. And then there was this one professor who was like, I'm interested in a student like you. I'm very happy to have you as my student. And then she sent me a reply and uh, she said she's going to fill out all the forms. And by September, I had the admission letter in my hand where uh, I was accepted into MUN for my master's in sciences course. I tried to apply for a visa back in Saudi Arabia, but since it was not my home country, I couldn't get all the documents together. So I got a rejection and I got a very easy opportunity to go back to India again. I just said I need to go home and collect some documents. I went back to India and I started collecting all my documents. And my father was helping me to get all these things together. It's um, he got sick and um, he had a heart attack. And uh, while he was helping me to go to Canada, he actually passed away. Today is the third anniversary of my father's passing, actually. Wow. And um, that couldn't stop me because I'm finally getting a chance to get out of Saudi. And I just couldn't do anything at that point. I had to keep going on. So my father was supporting me, helping me collect documents, but then dad was gone and I still kept moving on. I started collecting my documents. At that point, my mom had fallen ill. But, and those were the most lengthy days of my life. I had to take care of my mom, run behind the documents. And we, um, since dad had passed away, I had to do all the document change to my mom's name also, which I was doing by myself. Then I'd go home, do the dishes, do the cooking. And when I look at the time, it will be like 3 a.m. in the morning. And um, I finally got through my application for the visa as well. And months went by and, you know, it became March. And then around April, uh, I just was feeling really, very disturbed. So I just took a nap and I woke up. And for some reason, I just logged into my account and there was the visa approval waiting for me. Mm -hmm. And then I flew back to um, Chennai, which is another city in India. And I submitted my passport and uh, I got the counterfoil on my passport. And when I got it back, I had these goosebumps. I finally had the visa to go to Canada. It was not an easy process like what most people would think. I really fought for this. And this yeah. this whole fight, this whole war, this whole journey lasted for around four years. And just the preparation to go to Canada was around a year. I started in the February in February of 2017, 
and uh, by February 2018, uh, I was almost through. And by March, I had my visa and I was finally going to Canada. But unfortunately, I had to go back to Saudi because my stuff was there and I had some stuff to take care of. So I went back to Saudi. Even at that point, my family members there, they compelled me to go and uh, give a testimony in the church about going to Canada, which I didn't want to do because at that point, I kind, I kind of lost respect for the church or for the people or for anything. But I still had faith. I still believed in God. I still was a Christian at that point. Uh, so I went half-heartedly to the church and gave a testimony saying that I'm going to Canada just to uh, just for an exposure. I'm going to do this course and I'm going to come back. But deep down inside, I was like, no, I'm not coming back. This is the last time I'll see all of you and I'm done with you. And then I was so happy. I kind of packed my suitcases. Um, four years in Saudi Arabia and then my life just condensed to two suitcases. And I left Saudi Arabia. I still remember um, I was a permanent resident of Saudi Arabia at that point. I was so happy to surrender my residentship and get onto that flight. My father was so overprotective that he wouldn't even let me take a bus in India. Uh, even when I was in university, he'd come and drop me at the university and pick me back and take me home. So I'm finally on this international flight going to Canada, not knowing anything around. And on May 5th of 2018, I landed in Canada. Well, you are enjoying a new life now, Kitu, and are producing content on food, nature, and life in Canada for your YouTube channel. So life is very different for you now, but I'm sure the harm caused by the brethren uh, hasn't completely vanished. Um, that's very true, Mark. Um, I did try to uh, still stick on to, uh, to my beliefs, and I tried to go to church, but I still remember that incident where I went to church, I sat down, uh, midway through the service, I kind of started palpitating and sweating. I had this PTSD kind of uh, symptoms and I stormed out of the church and I've never mm. been to a church ever since. And later on in life, I realized that religion doesn't exist and I realized that I don't believe in God anymore. I'm not sure if God is true or not, but I don't believe in God anymore. I don't, I don't identify myself as a Christian anymore. Uh, I don't identify myself with any uh, religious groups, and um, I'm I'm okay about telling that out loud. I've also uh, let my family know because in an Indian culture, all this is a big issue. But I've let my family know about my beliefs, and they've been okay. I've completely cut myself off from this brethren church, from anything that identifies itself as a Kerala brethren, and um, it's gonna be three years. Uh, since I've moved to Canada, I've never looked back. Um, I used to be forced to believe that if I didn't um, pay attention to God, that my life is going to be a, a complete mess and things are going to just fall flat in my life. But that's not the case. Uh, I've I've had a really successful life. I did complete my degree. Um, I got uh, scholarships and awards. I did amazing internships. Uh, I have a job that at least pays my rent and gives me food and I'm living a very happy and peaceful life at this point. And um, like many of you who've been watching this channel, Mark kept mentioning about my channel. So I started my YouTube channel back in 2015 where I was actually going crazy in Saudi Arabia. I needed something to keep me sane. And I continued to uh, give out content in my channel just so that I find some purpose in life so that I don't lose my mind. I still put out content, but the objective of my content has completely changed. I put out videos for those who are interested to move to uh, Canada or to uh, Newfoundland or those who want to study in MUN. Um, back in the day when I was trying to get my life together and when I was trying to come to MUN, nobody helped me. I was doing this in secret. I, I don't know what problems anybody would be facing at this point, so I put out content for free and I go into the very... Uh, tiniest of details on how to move here and uh, I've been getting a lot of views and subscribers ever since I've been putting out this content. Life makes a lot of sense. I'm mm. all by myself in Canada, no family, no nobody to trouble me or harm me, but I'm doing really well. And I want, I really want the women 
who've been going through the same kind of abuse, maybe in the Kerala Brethren Assembly or even in any other Indian cult, to not just keep quiet. One thing I've realized as a woman uh, from India is that nobody is going to help you but yourself. If you need to get out of your situation or whatever kind of abuse or whatever kind of bondage you're going through right now, the only person who can help you is you. God is not going to come and do miracles. Nobody's going to magically appear in front of you and rescue you. If you really need to get out of a setup that is draining you mentally, physically, you have to do it by yourself. There's a lot of help out there. And for the most part, I used to watch this channel and I used to feel a kind of a belonging. I'm like, oh my God, there's so many people just like me. And that's when I reached out to Mark and I'm like, I have to send this person an email. I need to get this story out. And I was so glad that there was a platform that could get my story out because Kerala Brethren doesn't have a lot of information out there. But this is the truth that I went through. None of it is manipulated because I'm in a place in life where I don't need to manipulate any kind of a situation or a group or expose them just because I have nothing else to do. I just wanted the world to know that this happens. And in a closed country like Saudi Arabia, in a country that doesn't even allow you to worship any other god openly, this happened in Saudi Arabia. So if there's any other woman out there who needs help, you have help here. To start with, you can actually watch some of the videos in this channel and you would actually find your way to get out. Well, it's been a long and difficult journey from inside the cult to where you are now. And I must admit, I was surprised to hear that the exclusive brethren had offshoot sex as far out as Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, I will leave links to your Instagram and YouTube channel in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you, Kitu, for coming on to Talk Beliefs. Oh, thanks for having me, Mark. I was very happy to get your um, reply um, as soon as I reached out to you. Um, it's because of people like you who are out there looking out for people and reaching out to us is how we get the world to know about these kind of abuses that happen to us. I really wish you a lot of um, uh, goodness and uh, all kinds of uh, nice things in life, Mark. You're doing an amazing job. Um, I know you might run into a lot of, uh, you know, hate comments and all that, but never stop what you're doing. If I personally got help through you and if I'm able to expose all the horrible things that happened to me, that simply just means you're doing an amazing job. Uh, really, thank you so much, Mark, for giving me this opportunity to actually get across my story and my, um, my message to the rest of the world. And... Um, if I had to say anything to your viewers, the only thing I'll say is subscribe, like, share and also click the bell icon because that's what everyone does on YouTube. Thank you for watching this video. If you like the video, please share it to your friends. And it's, it's important that we create awareness that something like religion can actually ruin someone's life. So thank you very much. <laughs>